Thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Stick around to the end to find out how you can learn about maths, science and computer science in a fun, interactive way. Over the past 2,000 years, our planet's population has increased from around 230 million people to nearly 8,000 million people, slowly at first and then incredibly quickly in the past few centuries. At the same time, the concentration of carbon dioxide in our planet's atmosphere has increased, from around 280 parts per million to around 420 parts per million, slowly at first and then incredibly quickly in the past few centuries. Minute. The more people there are, the more energy gets used, and historically that energy has been provided by the burning of fossil fuels, which puts carbon dioxide into our atmosphere. However, the more people there are, the more food we need to grow, and food ultimately comes from the process of photosynthesis. Plants turning water, carbon dioxide and sunlight into sugars and oxygen. So more CO2 should mean more food, right? As ex-representative Lamar Smith, a Republican who chaired the House Committee on Science from 2013 to 2019, put it, a higher concentration of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere would aid photosynthesis, which in turn contributes to increased plant growth. This correlates to a greater volume of food production and better quality food. Amazing. Every word of what you just said was wrong. I, I'm not endorsing The Last Jedi, by the way. I think it's terrible. Let me know your review in the comments below! The science is very clear that more CO2 in the atmosphere means less food being grown. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change stated with high confidence in the most recent Working Group 2 report that climate change will increasingly put pressure on food production and access, especially in vulnerable regions, undermining food security and nutrition. And there are two crises bound up in that statement. The first is the amount of food we can grow. A planet with more CO2 in its atmosphere is a warmer planet, and as a rule of thumb, for cereal crops such as corn, wheat and rice currently grown in optimal conditions, each degree of warming results in a 10% decrease in yield. Crops don't like being hotter than they're used to. Now, you might think that as the planet warms, the places where we could grow food will extend towards the poles, and so we could just move where the farms are. And you'd be partially right. The world's natural wheat belt, for example, the locations where conditions are right to grow wheat, has been moving towards the poles at a rate of about 160 miles or 250 kilometers each decade. But the problem is, not all soils are created equally, and the locations that the wheat belt is moving into in Canada and Russia specifically have soils that are much less fertile than where wheat is currently grown, and those areas are less serviced by infrastructure. Studies estimate that wheat specifically might still actually increase in overall yield for a, a few decades as we warm, but the total yield of grains, in particular rice, maize and soybeans, will fall. It don't. It don't go down. Robert, it goes down. No, it don't. It do go down. Oh! <laughs> Additionally, a planet with more CO2 in its atmosphere, a warmer planet, is a planet with different patterns of rainfall. And we've already seen that droughts have become more common thanks to climate change. And while it's very difficult to model, scientists are pretty confident that in the future, droughts will be even more common and even more intense. And that will negatively affect agricultural output even further. And the warmer the planet gets, the worse the droughts become. As David Wallace Wells writes in The Uninhabitable Earth, these droughts will be the real problem for agriculture. At two degrees of warming, droughts will wallop the Mediterranean and much of India, and corn and sorghum all around the world will suffer, straining global food supply. At 2.5 degrees, thanks mostly to drought, the world could enter a global food deficit, needing more calories than the planet can produce. By 2080, without dramatic reductions in emissions, southern Europe will be in a permanent extreme drought, much worse than the American Dust Bowl ever was. For what it's worth, at that point, the American Southwest and Plains will be in a drought worse than anything we've seen in the past thousand years, and breadbasket regions of China, South America, the Middle East and Africa will no longer be viable as reliable sources of food. This is bad enough. There is no way we're going to be able to grow enough food for a still growing population on a warmer planet with more droughts. There will be widespread famines this century. Nothing to soften that one, that's, ju that's just a fact. But there is a second crisis bound up in that statement from the IPCC that I mentioned earlier, and it's not really talked about at all, yet is going to cause cascading problems. The second crisis is nutrition. 
In 2004, a paper was published in the Journal of the American College of Nutrition by Davis, Epp, and Riordan. The paper found that the nutrient content of various crops, potatoes, carrots, okra, cabbages, among others, had decreased over the past several decades. Food grown in the 1990s had less protein, calcium, iron, and vitamin C than that grown in the 50s. And by quite some margin, 15 to 20% decreases on average, and a nearly 40% decrease in vitamin B2. The authors concluded that this was due to modern farmers and gardeners choosing different varieties of crops that were faster growing but less nutrient dense. However, mathematician Irakli Laladzi, along with a few other scientists, didn't buy this. He hypothesized that as more and more carbon dioxide was present in the atmosphere, plants generally were undergoing an increasing imbalance in their elemental composition, containing more carbon from sugars produced by more photosynthesis, and fewer other molecules like vitamins that are produced using elements from the soil like iron and zinc. In other words, the plants were becoming less nutritious, and more like junk food. Summarizing in a Politico article titled The Great Nutrient Collapse, Laladzi says, Every leaf and every grass blade on Earth makes more and more sugars as CO2 levels keep rising. We are witnessing the greatest injection of carbohydrates into the biosphere in human history, an injection that dilutes other nutrients in our food supply. And this hypothesis was confirmed by further studies. A Nature paper in 2014 concluded that grains and legumes grown in elevated CO2 concentrations possessed significantly less zinc and iron. A 2018 paper looked at the protein content of 18 strains of rice and found that more CO2 in the air produced decreases in protein, but also iron, zinc, and various vitamins in the rice. Just to restate that, rice. What you doing? Drain the r oh my god! A crop relied upon by hundreds of millions, if not billions, of people who, in the future, will be increasingly deficient in vitamins and minerals that are fundamental to healthy biological function. Proteins necessary to grow and repair muscle and bone. A lack of iron causes fatigue. A zinc deficiency weakens the immune system. In a sense, this is nothing new. It's estimated that today, approximately 2 billion people suffer from deficiencies in iron and zinc alone, causing a loss of 63 million life years annually. In other words, people are sicker and are dying younger now because of these deficiencies. And those deficiencies are only going to get worse on a planet with more CO2 in its atmosphere. That might not sound as big a deal as there not being enough food full stop to go around. But think about what the knock-on effects are going to be. A population that is deficient in various micronutrients is a population that will be physically weaker, more likely to get sick, less able to recover from being sick or being injured, and will suffer more problems in pregnancy. In other words, a population that will be able to work less and will put increasing pressure on healthcare systems. Furthermore, those at greatest risk of these deficiencies are in the global south, where there's less healthcare provision and higher rates of disease, and so where the effects will be felt most keenly. An epidemic of micronutrient deficiencies will significantly, invisibly, amplify the other effects of climate change, such as shifting patterns of disease and the response to extreme weather events like droughts. Millions of people will die early because of this. And if that wasn't bad enough, it's going to specifically apply the most pressure to those parts of the world already hardest hit by climate change. As we so frequently find, the societal impacts of this crisis are interlinked, with one factor amplifying others. That means, however, that any actions we take now to limit the emissions of greenhouse gases will help fix this problem. The more action we take now, the more this problem is fixed. This provides a roadmap for us. In order to avoid widespread famines and an epidemic of micronutrient deficiencies that will cause cascading problems in global health, we need to do everything we can to bring emissions of greenhouse gases down to net zero as soon as possible. It's that simple. And, you know, also has a couple of other benefits. Finally, some good 
So Irakli Laladzi was a mathematician and performed his analysis of declining nutrition of foodstuffs using skills developed over his degrees in mathematics. Statistical skills in particular allow you to look at the world differently and do things that other people simply can't. But you don't have to dedicate yourself to degrees in mathematics in order to learn these skills. You can start developing them yourself using Brilliant, who have kindly sponsored this video. Brilliant is a website and app that improves your skills in maths, science and computer science by introducing you to new ideas and immediately getting you to apply them. They offer interactive, expertly written courses from middle school level to graduate school level across subjects as diverse as statistics, cryptocurrency, chemistry and astronomy. Crucially, Brilliant emphasizes that the objective here is just to try, not necessarily to be correct. After all, if you answer a question incorrectly, what's the worst that happens? You just learn from the experience and you improve for next time. If you're in full-time education, Brilliant offers an alternative resource to the classroom, shedding light on subjects from a different angle. While if you're in the big scary adult world, Brilliant offers an opportunity to develop your scientific thinking and problem-solving skills, and introduces you to subjects that you've always been a bit curious about. To get started for free, visit brilliant.org slash Simon Clark, or click the link in the description. And the first 200 people to do so will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription for themselves or a student in their lives. Thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video and for being, well, brilliant. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you found this subject interesting, then I'd highly recommend reading The Uninhabitable Earth by David Wallace Wells. I'll leave a link to that in the description. Next to that will also be a link to the Politico article I mentioned, The Great Nutrient Collapse, which is really eye-opening reading. I'd recommend having a look at that too. If you're looking for a video recommendation, then here's two from me over here. You can also subscribe to the channel down here if you're not already, and you can sign up to Brilliant. If you enjoyed the video, if enjoy is the right word, please do pop it a like and tell people about it you think may find it interesting. That just leads me to say thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.